Hello, and welcome to the video entitled Elliot Smith's Toolbox. I'm Addy D, and I will be your host. Boy, we are in for a fun and wild ride today. I am losing my mind. I will begin the video by expanding on some of the topics that I brushed over in my last video on Coming Up Roses. I identified a few key characteristics as signature in Elliot Smith's songwriting, things like mode mixture and chromatic voice leading. But today I want to dive even deeper into that harmonic wilderness and attempt to paint a portrait of the complex family of colors that becomes available to us when the doors to parallel and relative keys remain open to us. In other words, keep in touch with your relatives and don't forget to call your parallel uncle. I'll be pulling from several examples from the catalog and periodically adjusting my vantage point in hopes of offering a few more models of understanding and explanation for the kind of harmonic processing evident in these compositions. Part 1. Parallels. Mode mixture and the relationship between keys a minor third apart. In my previous video on Coming Up Roses, I identified the technique of mode mixture as a penchant of Elliot Smith's songwriting, specifically borrowing chords from the parallel major or parallel minor, respectively, depending on where you started or which you figure to be the home key. Borrowing from parallel major or minor is shorthand for the kind of key relationship that exists between two keys a minor third or three semitones apart. For instance, in Coming Up Roses, we oscillated between the keys of F major and A flat major. And since F major is the relative key to A flat major, meaning it uses the same scale of tones just starting in or emphasizing different points, it's reasonable to say that F major and F minor are the keys used. However, it gets a little shady when the namesake parallel minor or major chord is hardly or never actually heard in the song, and we merely hang out with the family members instead. For example, in Strung Out Again, this minor third key pairing is used. We start in A major, but quickly abort that tonality in favor of C major. Some may say we've modulated from A major to the parallel A minor, since they share the same scale of tones, but an actual A minor chord is never used in the song, so it feels absurd to describe it that way, although it technically isn't wrong and is useful as shorthand. I'd rather call the new key C major, up a minor third from our beginning key of A major. It's really up to you how you'd like to think about it. Two major keys a minor third apart, or a major key and a minor key built on the same root. But the effect is the same. We are really just using our best judgment for how it suits our needs in a given situation. Sorry, that was annoying. I just had to do some housekeeping. The point is there are so many ways to describe the same thing, which is why music theory is such a mess of approximations. And I'd like to offer you multiple options for how to wrap your brain around a given concept. And, and if you tell me I'm wrong, you'll only be proving my point. Come at me. Nah, bro, it's the media, dumbass. Come at me, bro. In both Coming Up Roses and Strung Out Again, the prominent tonality leans towards the higher, or flatter, aka parallel minor key throughout the composition. And the lower key, or sharper key, is used more sparsely as a color brought out for special occasions. Coming Up Roses is in F and A flat, and leans towards A flat. Strung Out Again is in A and C, and leans towards the C. But check out how the opposite is true in Miss Misery. The bulk of this song is in D minor, or relative F major key. The verse refrain resolves strongly on F major, and then on the first bridge we have a direct modulation to A flat. Mostly. And the best part, this six measure bridge ends in a dominant five, C7, pulling to F, some kind of F. Deceptive. He lands on a D minor, the relative to the F major that itself had a 50-50 chance of even occurring. Part 2. Relatives. Figure ground ambiguity. It's at this point in the video I'd like to turn to a wonderful paper by Rob Schultz called Tonal Pairing and the Relative Key Paradox in the Music of Elliot Smith which I was enlightened to thanks to the good people of the Elliot Smith Reddit page. And I just had to mention it here. Oh my god, this paper is so awesome if you like this stuff. And so articulate. It inspired me. Link below. Schultz magnificently lays out examples of tonal ambiguities and paradoxes within Elliot Smith's songs, as well as his general aesthetic attraction to paradoxes or things in opposition. Take the album titles Either Or, XO, Figure Eight, 
or the tattoo of Ferdinand the Bull, the children's book story of a big strong fighting bull who doesn't want to go fight but only wants to sit and smell the flowers. What stuck with me most was Schultz's use of the term figure ground reversal when discussing harmonies that move to relative keys. To quote Schultz, Relative keys are capable of manifesting the musical analog to the visual phenomenon of figure ground reversal, which is responsible for such familiar optical illusions as the Necker Cube, Duck Rabbit, and Face Face illustrations. He also notes that in tonal compositional practice, the relative major tends to be the more stable of the two keys and exerts a stronger pull than its minor key counterpart. With this in mind, I decided to base my visual on the Rubin vase, designating the relative major as the central vase and the relative minor as its negative space, or the faces looking in. So within the first verse of Miss Misery, tonality traverses from D minor to the relative F major. Figure ground reverses from faces to vase. Halfway through the verse, the vantage shifts back to the D minor faces. Once again, figure and ground reverse on the refrain with a strong resolution on the F major vase. In the first bridge, we jump from vase to vase in a direct modulation to A flat that same minor third key pairing we've been talking about, with some playful back and forths. The upcoming dominant C7 chord lays two possible paths to F, major or minor, which both prove to be deceptive when we land on D minor, the shadow tonality of F major, coming full circle back to the verse. In this example of the deceptive cadence in Miss Misery, one could see the path towards an indeterminate F root as a pivot point to those other relative destinations. Compare the C7 pulling to F to a major life event that prompts a heavy decision. We've opened up the portal to four possible futures, some obvious and expected, and some living in the negative space of the expected. Following this train of thought of the F root as a pivot point, we could lay it out like this Tetris staircase figure and one could conceive the inevitable expansion of the pattern looking like this, where climbing one space on the x-axis accounts for parallel key modulations, where the key changes by a minor third, and on the y-axis for relative key modulations, where a signature is shared. As a pitch space continuum, it splits the octave into four equal parts, and represents the fully diminished seventh chord, a pattern which repeats itself once three key movements have been made. For Coming Up Roses and Miss Misery, we only need this piece. Coming Up Roses spends most of its time on the A-flat orange side, while Miss Misery spends most of its time in the yellow. The remarkable thing about the bridge of Miss Misery is that when modulating from A-flat, it bypasses both Fs and jumps straight to D minor, the relative of F major, in a kind of teleportation maneuver. We can see here how the previously mentioned pairing of parallel major and minor keys, aka keys a minor third apart, alludes to this relative key paradox in that the root relationship of A flat major and F minor remains, but the manifestation of a major quality in both subverts the expectation and opens the door to another distantly related family of chords. Part three, strung out again analysis. One reason I wanted to break down this song is that the arrangement we're familiar with on From a Basement on the Hill is decidedly abrasive. The overdriven lead guitars are some of the dirtiest sounds we've ever heard on an Elliott Smith song, and mixed super loudly. The drums are crashing like a thunderstorm, and it sounds like there's one of those big orchestral bass drums in there. It's fucking awesome. And his vocals are intense, emotive cracking sometimes, and a little pitchy in that scratch vocal kind of way. While keeping in mind that From a Basement on the Hill was a collection of unfinished material intended as his sixth album, mostly left in the condition that it stood when he left us on October 21st, 2003, exactly 20 years ago this month, I do find the aesthetic of this rough and unfinished version to be entirely suiting to the song's twisted lyrical vignettes and spooky harmonies. However, I also believe there's a lot of subtle beauty and harmonic inventiveness that shines in another light when some of the layers are removed. So that's what I wanted to do. Another of Elliot Smith's favorites from the toolbox is the use of smooth chromatic voice leading. 
voices moving upwards or downwards in tiny steps. In Strung Out Again, much of this movement is carried in the bass. This rather familiar sounding chromatic movement is called a line cliché. There are two specific line clichés I can think of that have become ubiquitous in popular music, both of which Elliot Smith has used or alluded to multiple times. There is the ascending line cliché, where the line begins on the fifth of the first chord and rises up. It usually has to turn around pretty early though. Few have really tried to solve this one. It's hard to move from a minor seventh to a major seventh. And we do just love to hear sevenths resolve downwards, don't we? Strung Out Again uses the descending line cliché, where the root of the first chord sinks downwards. It also works great in major. Great example here in Frankie Valli's Can't Take My Eyes Off You. The root note of E major, voiced in the top here, descends chromatically all the way to G sharp, the third in E major. And maybe this one will ring a bell. For Once in My Life by Stevie Wonder uses both the ascending and the descending line cliché back to back. Then there's this fragment I'll add to the mix. The fifth descending chromatically down to the third in major keys. Usually encased within a 2-4 progression. I guess I'd call it the isn't it a pity line cliche or the Elliot Smith perfect authentic cadence. Not that he invented it, but used it so much that in my opinion, it took on an aesthetic identity in reference to his body of work. It's like Thelonious Monk in the whole tone scale for any of you jazzers out there. You do that and everyone thinks of Monk, he owns it now. So back to Strung Out again. Yeah, it's a rather usual chord progression for the most part with some fine alterations thrown in. For one, my ear really wants that first chord, A major, to be A minor. Because the chords that follow reflect an A minor, C major tonality, but even this presents us with some figure ground ambiguity, as it's unclear which is really the focal point. The song is in a brooding 6-8 timing that moves in large, slow steps. I'd really call it a trudge if I ever heard one. The first phrase of the verse features an unusual phrase length of seven measures. Another alteration, that B-flat chord is maybe a bit strange for popular music of this era, but it has a long history in classical and jazz and pop. It's called the Neapolitan or flat two, a mystical predominant chord used as a substitute for the four chord in minor keys. It works well due to having two common tones with that chord. A side note, this makes a pretty good rule of thumb for chord substitutions, having two common tones, and are usually found by moving a third away from the chord you want to substitute. Another trick of the trade for the Neapolitan chord is to put it in first inversion so that the 4-5-1 bass line we know and love is unchanged, while the upper voices spell the flat too. The normal thing to do would be this. Get Stranger by throwing in the Neapolitan substitute for 4. Change the minor 1 to a major 1, and you've got the turnaround. Except he keeps the B-flat chord in root position. No need for smoothness here. The second phrase is more metrically square. A full 8 bars with a walk down from C tagged on the end, invoking some momentary confirmation of C major being the focal point. A major, not buying it. Notice how the A major chord begins the downbeat of every section on this song, but is still made to feel like the misfit by means of nasty melodic choices. 
Going back to the verse, the vocal hinges on the fifth, E, embellished by the natural sixth, F sharp. An unusual sound for how quickly we jettison this A major tonality in favor of C, and unorthodox because you'd typically pick common tones that feel nice in both keys to set you up for a smooth key transition. The frequent and bold allusions to the A major tonality are never smooth, and he picks the most jarring tones to sing over it, the ones most uncommon to the C major tonality which dominates most of the piece. As mentioned, the theory books would call this A the parallel major in contrast to the A minor, the happier of the two, but the way he's treating it feels like another paradox. Let's revisit the definition. Paradox, a statement that is seemingly contradictory or opposed to common sense, and yet is perhaps true. As if to demonstrate to us, everything you've heard about Major being happy, it's actually not true. Major is the most fucked up, and I'll prove it. Following this paradox train of thought, it's calling to mind many lyrical lines throughout his catalog which describe smiles that aren't quite right or otherwise fleeting, short-lived. Just one of the many paradoxical images favored in Elliot Smith's lyrical style. This A major chord isolated, frozen on its own, is a snapshot in time. Like a photograph, it may seem fine and dandy if you don't know any better, but just like moments of joy, the brief smile crossing your face, the photo you are snapped in, it must move through time and have context. The chorus begins with A major, and Elliot sings a raised fourth, D sharp, over the chord, and a pagetura to the fifth, E. He's doing everything he can melodically to paint that major chord up like a clown, but it's also quite beautiful when you settle into it. The chords in the chorus sequence by descending a fourth, then ascending a minor third, A to E, G to D, then F to C. All major chords, and about as pure as a sequence can get. But as the jazzers will probably remark, it's a good rule of thumb that you never really want to sequence more than two or three times max. We flop back to A major on the seventh bar of the chorus, and the melody grabs C sharp, the major third. Dude doesn't really have any use for common tones here. We come back into the verse, straight on the A major, and in few cases has a major chord sounded so sickly than on this arrival. The thing I mentioned earlier about context starts influencing our perception of this A major tonality, and how much we can really trust it. At this point in the song, we've already had a rundown of the tense colors composing this chord progression, along with the spare turns of cathartic beauty that never last, and the dark depths have been exposed to us. We know how it begins and how it'll end. The textbook happy sound was a prank every single time. Why should we trust A major? Aside from a tag in the second chorus that pretty much covers all the ground in this song, it has a pretty basic structure of verse chorus, verse chorus, and verse instrumental to close out. For the final playthrough, I took the opportunity to write out a little piano arrangement and have some fun with it. Anyone who wishes to decipher my sloppy handwritten score can find the PDF below. Enjoy! Thank you. 